My name is Ani Minasyan. I'm the Executive Director of the Montreal Chamber of Commerce. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the 2018 Montreal City Council Candidate Forum. Um, I have uh, some people I need to thank as we begin. Uh, Sentinel Peak Resources sponsored the event so we could have this here at the beautiful Quiet Cannon Conference and Event Center. Um, our Government Affairs Committee, those of you who are here, if you don't mind standing when I call out your name, uh, Denise Campos, Southern California Gas Company, John Pringle, Rokemore Pringle and more, Armando Arenas, Century 21 George Michael Realty, Susan Ayala, Athens Services, Jane Nomura, Ms. Flowers, Amanda Parsons, Sentinel Peak Resources, Veronica Ramirez, Beverly Hospital, and Michelle Robinson, Kaiser Permanente. They couldn't all be here tonight. They couldn't all be here tonight, but they have played a, an integral role in making this happen, so I just want to make sure to acknowledge them. Uh, we have members of our ambassador community here tonight who've been volunteering and helping to help us to manage this event, so thank you all for, for taking time out to be here with us. And um, our candidates, we're very grateful that you've taken the time to participate in this process and helping to communicate with the voters uh, and having them uh, get to know you better. We have nine out of the ten candidates participating uh, tonight. Uh, Rosie Vasquez was not able to join us due to a family emergency, but we have everybody else here and we're very grateful that you're here. We know that it's uh, not easy to run for, for, uh, for office. It's, it takes courage, it takes commitment, it takes a lot of resources, and uh, we commend you on your courage and commitment to serve the city. Uh, I want to thank Byron Jackson, thank you so much. He has been integral in helping us uh, stream this event tonight on Facebook. So this will be streaming live on Facebook. It is already streaming now. And uh, will be available to view on our page after the event as well. So this way, even though our seating is limited here in this room, we hope that everyone at home will have the opportunity to have access to this event as well. I would like to uh, acknowledge all. Jack Hajinian is here, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you for being here. make sure we get it right. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our uh, the chairman of our board of directors at the Montreal Chamber of Commerce, Armando Arenas. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, welcome. We're very glad to have you here, as well as our candidates. So we're very pleased to have you all with us today. Uh, our city is uh, currently facing significant challenges and our five council members, three of which uh, will be elected to post November 6th, will have a great task ahead of them. Tonight it is our intention that the Montebello voters become better acquainted with the candidates so that they can be, make informed choices when casting their ballots. Now the Montebello Chamber of Commerce has a 106 year history, and that's actually eight years before the city of Montebello was actually founded. And what we are is we are a community of businesses working together with other businesses to foster a healthy local economy. So we're proud to present this opportunity to bring together the city's voters and candidates for city council. Now the chamber will not be endorsing uh, any particular uh, candidate. So this forum uh, is solely meant to provide an equal and fair opportunity for all the candidates to express their platforms and their policies. <clears throat> Now, I know there's been a lot of campaigning out in the community, but tonight, we want to show our best. So tonight, we are focusing exclusively on the issues. We want to have a, a supportive and a non-confrontational environment for productive communication between the voters and the candidates. So I respectfully request that the candidates and the audience members please honor the positive spirit of this forum and conduct themselves in proper decorum. Now, at this time, I'd like to invite tonight's moderator, Scott Smith. He's the president and CEO of Cerritos Regional Chamber of Commerce, 
and he's here to introduce the candidates and begin our program this evening. Okay, well good evening everybody. It should be a fantastic evening. This is the democratic process at work. Tonight the voters, all of you out here in the audience, will gain some more insight onto these uh, from these great candidates we have up here. Nine candidates vying for three seats. We get our money candidates that uh, we will be going through these questions as quick as possible. Keep your answers on point. Uh, no personal attacks. And uh, keep them within the context of the question asked. So I would like to introduce the candidates. And we'll begin down there. They are in, sorry, I've gone off script, I'm sorry. <laughs> So, uh, uh, nine of the ten candidates are here tonight. We have heard about uh, Ms. Vasquez earlier, and we will introduce the candidates in order in which they are listed on the ballot by the LA County Registrar Report. So, starting at the far end, we have Kimberly Ann Cobos Platform. Government Affairs Committee has prepared a few questions. Each candidate has been given these questions, and they'll have one minute to answer each question. At the end of the program, each candidate will then have a minute to give their closing remarks. Before their closing remarks, we will uh, open it up to questions from the audience. There are cards, and I think we've collected quite a few already. There are cards and pens at the registration table. Please write down your questions, and we will collect them, or you can give them to Ani. Up here at the front, Ani, everybody knows Ani. Thought you should, uh, or to the staff at any time, or some of the, ch the chamber board members as well. Uh, the questions will be screened to make sure they're on point and not personal attacks. Uh, our timekeepers are sitting here in the front row. Timekeepers, if you could raise your signs and hands there. So we have some keeping time. Candidates will be giving a 30 second warning, and then we will we will uh, stop it right at the time limit. If you go over, I will bust you. So uh, I'll give you my dad voice. Uh, so we'll go through that. And uh, the order of candidates for the opening statements will start on the far end. And uh, again, let's candidates take a deep breath. We're ready to go. We're going to pass that along. We have our mic runner here to help you out. So that will also keep you on time, because she will take that mic right out of your hand. <laughs> all right, so let's have a good time tonight. Let's inform the voters. It's important that you all listen. Try to keep your applause very short. I would recommend that we have the, maybe no applause until the end of each question for the opening statements, uh, so we can get through tonight and get to as many audience questions as possible. We have a hard out at 8 o'clock, so we'll be stopping in time so the uh, candidates can give their closing so with that, we will we will start. Kimberly, you go first. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for being here. The chamber and the for hosting this. And just about myself, I was raised here. I went to school here. Capital, Capital School, the alumni here, and I practiced medals in my school. I too went on to Cal State LA for my criminal justice degree and my master's in forensic psychology. My doctorate uh, in clinical psychology. Thank you. And uh, as far as myself, I'm not a politician. I'm a community advocate. I want to be your voice. I've been doing it for the entire time that I've been here, and I will continue to as one selected. So I want to be fully transparent. That's how my actions are. And also just trustworthy with each of you. So I hope you ask for your vote for Bonabello City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Angie Menace, and I am one of the 10 candidates seeking to be elected as one of your council members. 
know, I have a deep sense of personal value to serve my community by pursuing social and economic justice. I am a homeowner and mother of two children, two beautiful daughters, very strong and smart girls, Ruby and Hannah, 8 and 11, 11 and 8 years old. I am a daughter of Mexican immigrants, and more specifically, they come, they're from Guadalajara, Mexico, but they also call one and all their home. And uh, I lived here in the city of Montalvo uh, for over 10 years. I was actually born here. I was actually born in LA County Medical, but my parents lived here on Bradley and um, Beckley. Um, I have great memories of Montalvo as a child. But now as a mother, as a parent, I have seen the political improvement in our city all across the board with the same people that have been in positions of leadership. As far as aesthetics, culturally and aesthetically and economically, our city hasn't flourished. Now, I'm going to continue, I'm going to continue living in the city, and I want to be able to raise my children. And I want to see one of those I believe that to create a better community, we will serve our community. So I've dedicated myself, I've dedicated countless hours to working for nonprofits, churches, organizations such as Padres Monta de Cancer, the Wall of Memoria, walking alongside workers on the picket line, workers who face injustice that work, seeking for better wages. Now, I believe that with my experience as a social justice advocate, and as a public servant, I am just the equipped and the right person to be elected into one of these seats. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, this is my first term. This is also my hometown. I'm going into my fifth year. I want to just talk a little bit about some of my main areas of concern that I focused on as an elected official and as a culture recreation commissioner. Public safety, economic development, homelessness, transportation, and over the last five years, more than $82 million in state takeaways have significantly drained the city of Montebello's resources. The city has downsized staff, including in our public safety, we're down to 53 officers, and we're still facing over $200 million in long-term and immediate needs including the $178 million in deferred maintenance. 1% of the sales tax comes to Montebello. I have served this community. I created the fiscal stimulus ad hoc so we could do a needs assessment of all of the departments. I was the first person to create that fiscal stimulus ad hoc. I volunteer my time as a president, former president, of Independent Cities Association, where I represented 52 cities in Southern California. Supervisor Hilda Solis appointed me to the MetroLink Southern California Railroad Authority. She's, she's also appointed me to the Los Angeles Cannabis Advisory Working Group. She appointed me to the Metro Service Council, where I deal with transportation issues. Some of the things I've done, including um, partnering the city for the first Entrovision Music Festival, 5K, 10K run, partnering uh, to renovate the Veterans Memorial, working on the homelessness in the San Gabriel Riverbed, partnering Hearts of Compassion with Joe's Organization for Youth, where we give thousands of toys to indigent families. I've also been involved in the, in the um, lobbying in Sacramento to prevent our city from going bankrupt. And I want to say that is a huge win and a huge accomplishment for my first term. And I hope that you'll support me so I can do more good work. Good evening, everyone. My name is Delia Lopez, and I'm running for a seat here at the City Council of our beautiful city of Montbello. I believe it's the people, you, that sit here tonight and everyone else who wasn't able to be here tonight deserve honest, forward-thinking leaders who will create transparency and work hard for all our residents. From a young age, I've learned the meaning of hard work, thanks to my parents. I, I was raised in a humble home in East LA. Uh, they worked hard to give me the best education they could. Uh, working hard with them, I went to Sacred Heart Mary here in Montebello. And uh, through that sacrifice and that hard work, I earned scholarships to make it to Stanford University. 
And I'm proud to be a single mom and also to have instilled that hard work ethic into my son, who now uh, is continuing the tradition at Stanford University. But above all, I, I want to say my father is the one that instilled hard work in me. Um, he was a part of our neighborhood watch program, and he was also part of the United Neighborhood Organization locally. I lost my dad last year, but I can tell you that I can feel his spirit and, for, and tenacity in me, which is making me want to run and serve this community. After I, I, ser after I graduated from Stanford, I served in uh, two years in Mexico City as the US, with the U.S. Embassy, and I also worked for the state government, had a commerce, uh, trade and commerce office there. I was one of their business specialists. And uh, today I'm a communication specialist. And I'm helping companies grow and tell their story. And I want to put that skill to work for our city. As a resident, I want to ensure that my neighbors live in a safe and thriving community. I want to create a coalition of community leaders, community residents, and uh, create solutions that are going to benefit our city. Let's create, let's harness all our passion for our city and create uh, positive dialogue. I'm ready to get started with you, and I hope that you will take this into consideration tonight. I look forward to hearing your ideas and your concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, the Chamber and Southern Little Peace Resources for organizing this event. Uh, the Quiet Canyon for hosting us, and all of you tonight for coming out and uh, taking time out of your evening to listen to all the candidates. I'm a third generation resident of the city, a seven year homeowner, and I have almost 20 family members still living within the city. I went to Park, uh, Park Avenue Preschool and attended all of Montebello Unified School District schools. And after that, I had dreams of living in the big city. But after I graduated from UC Riverside, I decided to plant my roots here, to purchase my home here. And that's because I saw the potential in Montebello. Now, one, the thing that's great about Montebello is that I love our big city access and our small town feel where we have access to world-class entertainment and championship teams, but at the same time, you can go to your favorite burger joint and your, uh, the cashier that you see all the time still calls you Miho or Miha. <laughs> it, I'm becoming a bit of a rarity in this city. Um, as I go door to door and I talk to parents that came here to build a future for their families, they're telling me how their kids, uh, not much older, not much younger than myself, don't feel the same way. They don't see the same opportunities. I disagree with that outlook. The reason why I decided to plant my roots here is because Montebello is a city worth fighting for. We have amazing residents that are passionate and energetic. We have businesses that contribute greatly to the community. And we have uh, city departments and city staff that have gone through a lot of hardship and still stick with us. Um, the potential, uh, the energy, uh, you know, what Montebello is uh, hasn't gone away. It's still there. This is a city worth fighting for. As a product of this community, as a lifelong resident, and as some, someone deeply invested, I request your serious consideration for Montebello City Council this evening. Bill. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank all of you for taking the time this evening to come and hear our position on the important issues facing our community in this coming election. One of the obvious questions for most of the candidates is, here is why did you decide to run for city council? For me, the obvious question is why did you decide to run for city council again? And I had no intentions of running for another term. In fact, I was halfway on my way to retirement until several issues uh, surfaced this past year that made me reconsider that decision. First was a decision of the majority of the council to bring marijuana facilities, grow houses, and retail sales to our city. We simply do not have the resources to properly enforce and regulate these facilities. Without that, Montebello faces serious potential negative problems for our community, our residents, and most importantly, for our children. The second issue is Montebello's critical financial situation, which is highlighted by the fact that the state of California is doing a full high-risk financial audit of our city, which is done very rarely. The decision or reason for this is not because we have an income problem, we have an irresponsible spending problem, and that uh, needs to be addressed. And I feel that that's one of the other main issues. Therefore, I decided to run again because of that. Now, the uh, obvious question also would be, while you've been a member of the city council the last five years, why didn't you do something about these issues? 
Well, I have been on the minority of four to one and a three to two council. When you're in that position, there's little you can do to affect the outcome. You can bring the issues to light. You can pass your dissenting vote, but you can't change the outcome. But I think it's important to bring those to light because it makes the community aware of what's going on. This is one of the, are the main reasons why I decided to run again, but we must elect experienced leaders who understand the issues and have the knowledge properly to uh, resolve those issues that are affecting our community. So those are the uh, main reasons why I decided to run last, one last term for city council. Thank you. I too would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce and Industry for putting on this event and everyone that's here tonight. Uh, growing up in Montebello instilled in me deep family values and community service. Uh, I was born and raised here, and when I got married to my beautiful wife, Sona, we decided to stay here to raise our three children. But Montebello uh, is a town I grew up in in the late 70s and in the early 80s, but it's not the same town that I grew up in, even though that was a great time and I have many fond memories from that time. Our city is in crisis, Mr. Molinari is right, but I think what we can do with our city here is only limited by our, our ability to come together and to work hard to find solutions that can work. Those solutions aren't impossible. Those solutions can be found. And the first place we have to start is in city council. They have been jockeying for three out of five for far too long. Yes, three is the majority and that gets it done. But I say five out of five makes it a success. Let's make consensus the rule in council. And if council can be united, if we can actually do the hard work of sitting down with each other and saying, well, what is it that each of you believe is the important issue and working it out? We shouldn't just be content with saying, well, they're the majority, I'm the minority. We should try to do the hard work. Now, I'm not naive. I know there are times when we can do this. But I think we should try. Because if council's united, the city might look at that and say, hey, these guys got together. And maybe we should give them a chance to get behind them. And I think that's where we start. Because the solutions and the problems are many. But we're not going to get there if we can't agree and learn how to move forward. So I ask for your vote. Uh, very humbly. Thank you all. Hello, uh, my name is Salvador. And uh, first of all, thank you for, for having us here. And thank you all for, for coming and uh, joining us tonight. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, I was born and raised in the city. I went through all the Montebello Unified School District, uh, went to uh, Montebello High School, graduated there. And, um, you know, ever since, you know, I was a teenager, I've been giving back to the community. I worked at, uh, volunteered at Ratchet's Meadow. Uh, I did that for six, seven years. And that's always been my passion, to, to grow the community, to, to work together. Um, I joined an organization here uh, that also gives back to the youth. Uh, you know, in my later years, and the reason why I decided to run is because we need we need change. We need a new vision. We need we need to move the city forward. Um, unfortunately, the last 10, 15, 20 years, our, our city has been lacking behind. We need to be a leader. We need to be the one that leads amongst all our neighboring cities. Unfortunately, we've been following. Uh, there's no transparency. We need to change that. So hopefully, with your support. Uh, you can uh, have the trust in me to get the city back on track, to move the city into a better direction, and to hold uh, people accountable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And I would also like to thank the Chamber for hosting this event tonight. I think it's very important that the community is here today so you can hear the vision that each one of us has to bring to the table, as opposed to listening to rumors and trying to pay too much attention to uh, what somebody else is telling you. Uh, for me, I have been here already going on nine years, and I've been, this is coming from right my third term. My first four years in one about, folks, I'm going to be honest with you, this financial problem that we have now, it's been here since I got elected in 2009. In 2009, we tried to make cuts, we tried to speak to the budget, we tried to do certain things, and I knew those four years, what we were doing was not working. You just can't cut, 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 and pretend that everything's just going to get better. These last four years, I have made the tough choices to give you, the community, the opportunity to make the tough decisions of whether or not you want to sell a water company that's been great for the city, and the paperwork doesn't 
you to pull those documents from the clerk's office. We also, I wanted to give you the opportunity to see if you want to work for a sales tax. One of the things that we came here to see, especially when I'm not in the board, is people say, well, look at neighboring cities. They're doing so much better than we are. Yes, but you know what? Those neighboring cities, they have utility tax. They don't have uh, 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 their very own police and fire like we do, which I am the only incumbent that is supported by our very own police and fire. And the reason they did that, and I'll be very clear about that right now, is because they know that I'll be making the tough decisions to be able to bring those resources and the manpower that we need out of every other city employee who has not had a raise in over 10 years. So while we sit here and criticize the tough decisions that the council member makes, the bottom line here is that long ago we should start making some tough decisions as to what kind of ways we're going to be able to bring in some very in this community. But that said, thank you all very much for being here, and we can elaborate a lot more with the questions that are coming. Thank you. Thank you all. Give them another round of applause for all our candidates. We're going to move into our prepared questions. If the audience, you can hold your applause till the end of about every question, then we'll, have, we'll give you a chance to do what you just did. Applaud, hoot, and holler, whatever you'd like. Um, but if you could do that. Also, if you can take out your cell phones and silence those. Uh, you know, we have a limited amount of time, and it's very disturbing to the candidates while they're answering these questions. All right, now we're going to start in a round robin format. So we'll just be moving one candidate down for the rest of the questions, or everyone gets a turn to answer first. So with that said, we'll start with Angie first. And that's the first prepared question. You'll have one minute for this. And I'll repeat the question if you'd like. The question is, the city of Montebello has been facing a large fiscal deficit. What steps would you take to reduce that deficit? So, I believe that we need to stop and listen to, um, we need to be innovative. So, I believe in innovation, and innovation begins with collaboration. The collaboration of ideas, the collaboration of, of skill sets. And I believe that we need to bring um, take in the smart ideas, take in everyone's um, input for professional input in order to be able to fix our budget. I'm oh, sorry, I'm looking at the time. Um, so again, I think it's, it's, it's important that we take a look and listen to, um, to the smart not the smart, I'm sorry. I believe it's important to be innovative about it, be innovative in, again, collaborating with different, different folks, different ideas, different um, ways to be able to move out of this deficit. And we need to be open to new, to new ways to be able to generate revenue to the city. Thank you, Angie. All right, same question is about the deficit. <clears throat> First of all, I want to just, you know, read off a couple of things. Our general fund, you know, uh, just our police alone is $20 million. Our fire is $14 million. Our public works is almost $9 million. We're a full-service city. You know, one of the things that I did in my state and city address was the breakdown. We get $0.10 cents of every dollar. This is, this is my, my state of the city address. At the bottom, very bottom of this, is what we're dealing with for a full service city. Now, some of the things that I've been supporting are economic development. You know, we, we have been working hard to, we put in the Starbucks, we put in the Chipotle, the Habit. Those are gen, revenue generators. The Costco, even though it left, we're gonna be getting 50% in five years, and we're gonna be making 18% all the way into the future in the marketplace. Those are positive things that we've been doing and I've been working on. I will continue to bring in revenue and bring in new businesses, retail, and housing. All right, all right. Thank you. So clearly, we've heard there is a definite uh, issue with our budget. Uh, and it's, it stems from many years ago, before some of us have been, well, never, I've never been on city council. So I think what, what clearly we need is a leadership that's going to sit down at the table together, review what has happened in these last few years, be able to come together to look at long-term solutions. Where has this money gone? 
How has this money been allocated? Uh, what services are lacking? Uh, clearly we have uh, a shortage of staff. So we need to be innovative, we need to be creative, but we also need to be making some hard decisions as to how we're going to create these long-term solutions. Only that way will we come up with uh, a, a long-term solution to our budgets. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I feel like this is a multifaceted issue. Uh, I feel like there are three main points to the way that I would approach this. Uh, we're talking about business, we're talking about property, and we're talking about services. In terms of businesses, I would like to see our main arteries developed a lot more. Uh, I feel that a lot of commercial properties along Whittier and uh, Beverly Boulevards, along um, Garfield and Wilcox are being unused. I think that we need to look at our general plan, we need to find a way to attract businesses and build those shops. Um, another thing that I feel that we need to do is take a look at how to increase our, our property tax base. Now, of course, we have the Montebello Hills project going on. That's a whole beast unto itself. Um, one of the things that concerns me there are the health effects of building on top of the oil wells. But um, another thing that we need to look at, too, is um, not developing so much in Montebello, where I'm talking to, to residents and they're telling me that they can't park at their house and they have to park around the block because, uh, you know, apartment units are, are uh, starting to take up this whole thing as property values rise as rates increase, um, it's becoming, you know, you're getting uh, several uh, people in the same unit and parking's impacted. Thank you, David. All right, Bill. Yes, as I said earlier, Montebello doesn't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem, irresponsible spending. We pay far more, far more taxes in Montebello than any city our size in this area. If we get back to sound business practices, every bid should go out for competitive bidding. There shouldn't be single bid contracts where certain favored individuals are given the contract without competitive business. This is the, the, the core of the problem. And by getting back to doing what we've done in the past and what we should be doing now and what is required in some cases by law, then this, this revenue problem would be easily resolved. And that those funds could be used to increase our police and fire and other city services. But as long as we consider this pattern of spending that does not make sense and that is you know, totally uh, unacceptable, we are not going to see the situation resolved. Yes, I think the budget problem is, the budget deficit rather, is solved by an economic development plan. That's something that we've been sorely lacking in this city. It seems like when Governor Brown took away our community redevelopment options, it's like we didn't have another plan. We were just sitting back and just letting things roll. Because <clears throat> deficit's a really simple concept. It means you don't have enough money to pay for everything you need to pay for. So if you're in your house, and you can't afford to pay for everything you want to do, what do you do? You can cut back, but another option is to also find a way to bring in more money. Some people take second jobs, for example. Now, a city is a little more complex than that budget, but the concept's the same. So I want to find ways of economic development. Number two, I want to bring the residents who want to be involved into the process. I think, again, we need transparency and accountability to the extent that everyone understands the city budget, I think will go a long way as to bring everyone along as to what needs to be done. Yeah, so besides, you know, having transparency and accountability and, uh, you know, moving forward, making the right decisions and to get into contracts and bringing the right businesses, businesses that make sense, you know, um, what we need, and there's a development going on right now, Whittier, Montbello, we need businesses that complement each other. So we need to support our small businesses little by little to get that, um, get that, you know, cut the deficit. We also need to figure out like a 10-year business plan. I feel like the situation right now is we just have a band-aid. We put a band-aid on everything, and we really don't have a solution like 10 years how we can actually pick up the city, city or or have an actual plan to to cover the deficit. So um, you know we need to help small businesses. We need to have a plan moving forward of how we can actually increase the, the revenue into the city. All right, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. I think we've already started uh, trying to get out of the hole with the uh, budget uh, the last four years. As a matter of fact, we just still, we did a development in the corner of Whittier and Olympic Boulevard, which was just an empty lot with old city vehicles in it. 
Uh, and then we were able to sell it for a little over $2 million. We went ahead and now developed it, which is fully uh, occupied now. Now we're going to know that those people are going to be paying property taxes. They're also going to be paying license plate taxes, because when you pay the license plates, they get that uh, some of those taxes coming back to the residents of the vehicles on that. And of course, we bring more demographics, meaning we bring more shoppers, more people that are going to buy in the city on the belt. We also start uh, uh, a new project on the Woodward Boulevard. So those are the types of things that I would like to see definitely for economic development. And I think we have an excellent golden opportunity to do something with the empty hospital site where it's at now. Everybody wants to be on the 60 freeway. I don't look at it as an old, old, you know, possible left. I look at it as a golden opportunity for this city to really start making some really serious income. And uh, also, I would like to keep, keep doing projects like that. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Mike, to Kimberly here. As the mic comes down, Kimberly, really, I'll remind you, the city of Montebello has been facing a large fiscal deficit. What steps would you take to reduce that deficit? Um, Mr. Moraldi had brought up an excellent point about the fiscal um, deficit, but I myself, one of those rich in culture and diversity. Do you remember when you were growing up? I mean, okay, I'm 38 years old. When they said, what about the Beverly Hills of the East Side? What we need to do is we need to rebrand Montebello in a positive way so that we can make businesses want to come, developers want to come to Montebello. And for myself, I'll make myself available to the developers, but also to the community members. I know what each of them want. And so there, there is a dialogue between the community and as well as the developers. But also, I would love to bring in healthy and economic choices, not just political ones. Thank you. We'll move on to our second question, and Vivian will begin mm -hmm. the second question. And uh, again, please give them all a round of applause. Just... <laughs> you never know what made it to go by that fast, did you? Uh, question number two. What would you do to improve the appearance of the city, and how would you go about enacting your plans? Well, first of all, I've been working on the street ad hoc for several years. Uh, part of the appearance and the problems are related to the potholes, the sidewalks, the streets, the infrastructure is so deteriorated. So we've been uh, working with uh, one of my colleagues, with the staff, and the appearance, you know, really, it comes from giving volunteering time on some of these ad hocs and coming up with solutions and plans. Uh, what streets, what arterials we're going to clean up, we're going to fix the streets, we're going to work with the grants, we're going to look at the different measures, and we allocate the funding to fix and repair all of that infrastructure. Uh, we've been flying up, and I've flown up to Fresno to fight for a grant. We're going to be expanding Montebello Boulevard. We got, uh, I think it was $4.6 million of a grant, and we're matching it with $1.2 or $1.4 million. That's an improvement. The, the businesses we've been talking at the ICSC shopping center didn't want to come into Montebello because we don't have a high median income level. All right. Well, we need to raise the median income level and we can attract the commercial centers that we desire. Thank right. you, Vivian. Thank okay. you. All right. Then the next question, what would you do to improve the appearance of the city and how would you go about enacting that? So I, I think uh, what's important here is really there's so many residents, and as I've been walking, there's a lot of passion for our city, a lot of residents that have lived here for many, many years. I think we need to harness that passion, that uh, desire to see our city grow, and uh, and be part of that solution. So I think, you know, clearly we have some issues with uh, staffing. Some of our departments don't have the adequate staffing, and we also have uh, a problem with some of our uh, generating revenue to ensure that streets are getting paid, trees are getting trimmed. But uh, we also have a lot of community groups, a lot of local youth uh, youth groups. Why not get our students and our schools involved as well? Beautifying our city should not take that much effort. And I think together we can do that as a community. Thank you. Thank you. So my plan is twofold. I'm going to bring it a little bit back to business and I also want to talk about community. So, I feel that there's an opportunity to develop good here, but in such a way that we can also beautify uh, with here at the same time. The problem that I see is that businesses are waiting for customers and customers are waiting for businesses. It's like a bad thing. 
But what we can do is bring art into, into it here and take advantage of the social media revolution. Now, if you look at Pink Wall on Instagram or on Facebook, you'll see that it has 200,000 tags. What that means is that there's 200,000 pictures out there that have been tagged with Pink Wall, and that's free advertising across Los Angeles. When people come to take pictures next to the artwork that we're going to put up uh, in there in the downtown Montebello, businesses are going to see that, that traffic and they're going to want to take advantage of the people that are there. The second thing, as businesses come in and we increase our tax revenues, we're going to be able to get full back on code enforcement because a lot of the issues that we've seen are, are already in our codes. They, they can't be addressed um, adequately if we have proper city staffing. Uh, you know, city hall has just been devastated. That's fine. Bill. You know, just like we take pride in our own homes, we should take pride in our city. One of the key elements of that is code enforcement. We have the ordinances on the books, but one thing I am very troubled by, I went by city-owned property the other day, the weeds are higher than the fence. If we don't set the example of the city, then how do we expect other folks to do so? Also, there's many businesses with absentee owners that don't feel like they should take care of their business because they live elsewhere. The gentleman lives in San Marino was on my case today. After the weeds and debris on his business, yes. I don't live here, so why is that? I'm too busy making money. Well, that's I told him that's my front yard. So really, what we have to do as a community is demand that we do a better job of looking at the areas that are unsightly and or in many cases are major thoroughfares that are windows for our community, and start with those and make sure that some of the major property owners who are be allowed not to appear to close it around the books are required to do so, just like we require residents when they. Uh, go after them for unsightly like, homes. So it's not rocket science, it's just a simple uh, case of doing uh, the proper thing. Thank you, Bill. What do you do the appearance of the city and how do you go about it that your point? So the appearance of our city didn't come about in one day. And if anyone tries to say that we can take care of it in one day, they're not really telling you the truth. It's a problem that you need to get around and plan for, but it's going to be a long-term solution. I think, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. If we can get together as a city, then we can accomplish things that right now seem impossible to accomplish. Bill's right. We do have very large landowners, but maybe they haven't been approached in a way that can combine their efforts with the civic movement. They're all residents here, too. Some of them long-term residents. Uh, probably many people in the audience know that. But we haven't tried to really get together around problems to solve. Because that's how it is. When we unify and we say we're going to do it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I agree with everyone. Um, you know, walking, we've walked on thousands of homes. And me, myself, I've tripped on a couple of potholes. And so I've been team. And we've seen that the street has not been taken care of. And, you know, those are the concerns that most of the residents have. You know, they, they you know, cut the trees, you know, um, fix my streets, you know, get some, um, yeah, fix the potholes. So those are some of the stuff that we can start taking care of right now. As soon as they, they might seem little to us, but if you deal with it on a daily basis, it's big things. Now, the way we can start doing that is, it's not so much, there's so much we can do, but it's honestly, it requires a team effort. That means the community needs to get involved. We can all take part of this. We can all contribute to good fire city and that if we work together, if we you know get committees with our help and with our resources and we work all together, we can get you know we can get our streets to uh, base and we can start beautifying the city. Thank you. Yes, actually one of the things that uh, we have been trying to do. I have over the last four years of all the my colleagues is to change the approach of the city. It's obviously good revenue, but I've heard some of my colleagues who are running for, uh, for office. Uh, they've all said, you know, some of these issues are our law enforcement, our populist treatments. But you don't do that stuff, folks, with the manpower that we have right now. The manpower we have right now, I've got to commend our city employees for doing a phenomenal job with the equipment that they have, with the personnel that they have. Right now, I think our city really needs to bring the revenue, as I mentioned earlier, so that we can go ahead and hire more people to be able to do those jobs. Go ahead and upgrade the equipment that we have. And uh, I think definitely one of the things that we need to do is definitely increase the city revenues so that we can continue to provide the services and continue to have our city look even better than what it looks like. Thank you, Mike Stanley, Kimberly, and uh, Angie.
to finish up this round. Again, I'd like to remind you, the question is, what would you do to improve the appearance of the city and how would you go about enacting your plans? Well, everyone brings up excellent points about the potholes, but just patching them up is not a good solution. Because we see that after semis drive on the, our school buses drive on the streets the same way. But I believe we should look into the pavement management program, just like the city of Pink River did. Utilize Prop C money as well as Measure N and R money. We invest in our infrastructure, and guess what? The developers invest in the develop. And that's what we need. And I'm sorry, we need to trim our trees, but we need to get help because we only have one person currently doing that. And that needs to be changed. So I have experience in getting things done like this. I've previously worked for the mayor, uh, the former mayor of Los Angeles, doing constituent services, and we created these days of service. So we empowered our community to come out and host these days of service. But we also partnered up with, um, we apply for grants. There are grants that are out there. We need to be able to tap into the, there's money. We need to, on the state level, we need to develop these relationships with our local state officials as well as our county folks, because there is money there that could come into our city to help us beautify our town. Now, we can empower our youth by, we have a lot of young artists and older artists <coughs> creating murals, we have mural spaces. But I was a person that would get the call in the mayor's office to do the tree trimming, to do the pothole fixing, and this is the experience that I had for eight years. So, I would go, I would start with developing relationships and more solid relationships with our state elected officials and tap into the money that is there from the state and, 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 um, and the county. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Okay. That was question two. Give them another round of applause, please. Thank you, Debbie. Deep breath. We're uh, on to question three. We'll start with Debbie on this one for our round robin. Question number three. Uh, and this is a good one. We've already touched, some of you have already touched on this. What is your position on the current ordinance on cannabis? If elected, will you change it? And if so, how? So uh, all, all of us know that the ordinance are, has already passed. Um, I've taken a, a, a good look at it. Uh, there are still a lot of things that have not been addressed. Uh, the ordinance was simply uh, put out to, uh, an RFP was out. Some bids have been uh, taken, but outside of that, nothing else has been established. I think uh, first and foremost, we need a clear and transparent process. We need to make sure that as a city council, we sit down and really review what is being put in place uh, before anything else happens. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, why didn't the voters get to, to decide this? There's still an opportunity. If voters wanted to put it on a ballot, they can. And if they, if, if as voters they did, I, I would, uh, I would support that. But again, uh, as a, as a city council person, I would ensure that any, anything put, uh, put in place is reviewed carefully before we take on any uh, company in the city. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to frame the issue the way that I see as it stands today. Um, as Nelly mentioned, the ordinance has already been passed and certain uses have already been approved for Montbello. That's manufacturing, lab testing, uh, and indoor cultivation. Now, I'd like to say it in two parts. If I was to take a, a seat on the city council today, I feel that we have the tools in our tool belt to effectively regulate these businesses. Now, uh, what I'm talking about there is um, looking at additional sensitive uses. We already have um, places where there are children, schools, churches, uh, the city has the power to create additional sensitive uses. Uh, on top of that, I also feel that we can put the onus on the business owners to uh, provide security and take the pressure off of our police force and our fire force. Those are tools that we have uh, in our tool belt. Now, in the future, I feel that this is a contentious enough of an issue that um, if that if we were able to get it for uh, a special election, that I would I would support it going to a vote of the people because the community is extremely divided on this, and I think that Montebello uh, needs to speak on it. Right, thank you. First place, let's call it what it is. It's not cannabis. Cannabis is a fancy word for marijuana. We try to make it sound a little more uh, uh, acceptable. If I had three votes of the city council, this would be gone in a heartbeat. 
There is no benefit to the city of Montebello bringing this into our community. We simply don't have the resources to properly enforce and regulate it. More importantly is our youth. Over two million youngsters are using marijuana in these e-cigarettes. And now the major bottling companies, including Coca-Cola, are going to start infusing marijuana in soft drinks. Tell me who's that target that. And this is totally unacceptable. They should not be uh, exploiting our children to make money. And even if there was funds left over from enforcement, which is very unlikely, uh, we shouldn't be running our city on drug money. It is simply not the most effect effective way and uh, it's going to deteriorate the appearance of the image of our community and going to uh, create uh, other problems. Medical, uh, for medical situations where marijuana folk feel it helps them, that is certainly acceptable and should be permitted. But that's not the issue here. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll have your time to, to hoot and holler after we get through the questions. Keep here, Sean, please. Yeah, I think the issue has to be framed as follows. Number one, we have to all understand that any properly licensed person from another city can deliver marijuana right into Montebello just like Domino's Pizza. So the question isn't, is it going to be here or not? It's going to be here, legally and otherwise. The question is, are we going to use the tools of law to regulate and maybe find a way to have the city gain some revenue from it? Or are we going to proverbially throw our head in the sand and say it's just not going to happen here, even though it is and it's already happening, and we're going to miss out on all the state revenue that we could get for enforcement, education, and health, and we're going to, we're going to essentially not use the law. And as an officer of the court, as an attorney, I'm a big believer in the law, and I think the law here can be used to help monitor. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and actually marijuana is a negative connotation to pronounce. It's actually, it should be cannabis, that should, should be labeled. Um, and, and it, um, it's, um, do we want to be, you know, a leader in this industry or do we want to follow and see what other cities are going along? I think that's a real question. Um, and you know what, I, I think in the next five years, this is going to be something that's going to be approved federally. And you know, it's, it's gonna be something that we're gonna have to regulate it away. Do we wanna like pretend like it's not happening or it's not gonna happen? That's not the case. So what we need to do is we need to have a transparent, um, transparency in the bids. We need to have uh, town halls to explain um, you know, everything that's going on, the whole process, actual information in regards to cannabis, of pros and cons, and just have detailed information. If there's a lot of misinformation out there going on, I've heard it all, we need to have real science behind it and real, really educate the, the population on the pros and cons of cannabis. And um, you know what? I would also put it to the people. I know March and April we have a special election. All right. We, we got a big Yes, I'm actually uh, uh, someone who supported this and made the ordinance and passed it. And I will give you my reasons why very briefly. Uh, first is because I, the one that I keep mentioning is our city deficit. Our city needs to start making money, and as one of my colleagues colleague directly from my said, this is something that's already happening. It's already legal in the state of California. If we can't turn the point by, if you're talking about accessibility, this, all you got to do is a little bit past city limits, bring out the market, and there's already two dispensaries. The bottom line here is that people can already order it and get it delivered to the city of Montebello. So to me, it's never to enforce and regulate what's already legal in the state of California and try to make tax revenue out of it. I mean, why should we not be, be making money since we're going to be spending the money and enforcing it anyway in the illegal way when it's still coming in here? So I'd rather uh, regulate it and enforce it and collect tax revenue. Okay, we're going to take it down. Uh, again, Kimberly, this is a question. What is your position on the current ordinance of cannabis? If elected, what would you do to change it? And if so, how? Well, I believe it should have been left to the people because it is for the community, right? But my problem is, you know, if you hear, you hear cannabis, it's fine, and it's no recreational use in your home, in your home, but not 600 feet from a school. Currently, I have 42 children that I counsel with the need of drug level to Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and many of them go to Vail High School. That's really close to some of these buildings. Another problem I have is we're not comparable to the other surrounding cities, like the city of Kaname. Our application fee is not even a thousand dollars, but yet the application fee for Kaname is eleven thousand nine hundred seventy-five. 
So who's really making the money? The second look for Fed aid is 6975 For us, maybe a couple hundred. Again, who's making the money? We want revenue here in Montebello. I think we need to regulate it. So, cannabis is legal already here in the state of California. And um, it is unfortunate that there is so much stigma around just the leaf itself because people think it's marijuana. So, um, I believe that since the ordinance has already passed, it would make sense that if it's going to generate money, we put this money into a safety fund that will eventually and eventually provide the revenue to be able to increase our public safety, perhaps going to education and health. I don't believe that, I do, I do think it should be something that could be taken to the voters, but another thing that people I don't think understand is if you do a study and if you do your research, majority of residents and citizens are for cannabis. Now, knowing that this ordinance has already passed, it's in a zone area. It makes sense to regulate it, monitor it, and if we could reap the ben financial benefits to generate revenue for our city, to make improvements in our city. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, Major. Thank you. Well, I had no problem with the marijuana. My dad used it, my niece used it for cancer treatment. I had a problem with the process and lack of town halls, lack of information, no police, no fire reports, and the fact that HDL Company, who's the leader in the cannabis industry, was suddenly replaced without direction from the city council, exposing us to risk and liability in the process. That is why I voted no. It was the process being tainted and corrupted. I oppose that. Now, I don't know who has a financial interest, but I know people have already bought properties and they're being promised licenses. I have an issue with that. If these are merit-based companies running a, a, a business, and this is a cash business, remember, and no banking institution will, will allow those deposits, then why didn't they select HDL? HDL is already doing work for the city, the taxation for the city. They would have had the process clean and then we would be sued and risk, risking liability. All right, thank you. Great, right, thank you very much. That's right, give them another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this will be the last prepared question before we go to audience questions. Question number four, and we will start with David. All right, question number four, if elected, you will be part of a five-member council. How will you work with your fellow council members to accomplish your goals? I run my campaign largely the same way that I plan to serve in office, and that's by being uh, approachable to every member, uh, every candidate, and I plan to be approachable to every council member. We don't move forward by taking uh, strong positions on the opposite side and being this city has uh, been stuck with councils that uh, that don't work together, policies that don't move forward. A decision is made and quickly reversed. A special election uh, comes across and, and people are, are uh, taken out of office. I feel, or what I will do uh, in council is really be open. Um, I have very strong beliefs, but I think that what's best for the residents is to speak to the other side um, and to work together to create a better one. You know, when I was first elected, I thought you ride in on the right horse and uh, maybe the city get everything you want. You find, quickly find out in the political process that doesn't work. Consensus building is important, but more importantly than that is civility and a respect for the opinions of other individuals rather than the situation we have in our community today where if I raise an issue, I don't get a response from a colleague, I get a, a personal attack. That destroys the essence of the, of the democratic process because unless you have an environment where open dialogue an exchange of ideas can take place, we are not going to be able to address the important issues for our community. But more so is to be well informed on the issue and understand what the potential impacts are. Sometimes we think things will be great and then we find out 
uh, not so great at the end of it. So uh, an informed council, an informed community, and working together with the community is the most effective way of getting uh, the proper things done that would benefit our community. Thank you. Yes, uh, for 10 years I worked for the State Bar of California, which is the licensing authority for attorneys. And my job essentially was to investigate client complaints against attorneys. And when I found that the complaint was well taken, I would call on the attorney for one last meeting before charges were filed to discuss that uh, the case that I uh, believed I could prove against them. And as you can imagine, this was never an easy meeting because the attorney's coming in and being told that the job or that he or she has been doing they may not be able to do any more at all or they're going to be uh, suspended. Uh, I like to say, uh, unfortunately, I never saw so many grown men crying until I started working for the state bar. <laughs> but that experience that I had in working with people and finding common ground in the most difficult of situations, I think, directly translates to the diets. And I am an open person, and I think the process itself is done openly, too, as the Brown Act requires. We're going to be all deliberating uh, openly in front of the public. And I think one thing that Mr. Molinari said, I take really to heart. Civility is very important. Thank you. Doug. Yeah, definitely, you know, it's key working together. We, we won't move this city forward unless we work together. We are going to have different ideas, different perspectives, different ideologies. But there has to come a time where, you know, we have to come together for the better of the city. Um, there are things that we might have to sacrifice in order to move something forward. And, you know, that's going to require a lot of hard work, a lot of energy. But, you know, it's up to us, it's up to the community to, to work together. We all, everybody here has different perspectives and ideologies. Even here, um, you know, everybody was running. You know, I think they're all good people. They just have a different ideology on how they feel they can move the city forward. So we need to work together, we need to cooperate, and um, we need to see more four or five votes just to move the city forward and get, you know, get back on track. Thank you. In my experience as a city council member, I've noticed that uh, I've always taken the approach that I agree to disagree. I have never gone personal with anybody or personally attacked anyone. I've always stated why I work for a certain issue or why I disagree with someone. But I think the culture has been here ever since I've, since I've been on the city council has been that to not agree to disagree. I mean, you disagree with somebody and they're going to be already, you know, trying to they're trying to recall you or do whatever they're going to do. And I think uh, uh, as some of my colleagues who were running. Uh, mentioned is that one of the things that we need to do is that we all need to just take the seat back and really try to look at and work out together certain issues that we need to work out. And if they don't work out, that's fine because guess what? There's a lot of other issues in the city for, on the table that need to be resolved. And you're not going to resolve it by not communicating with each other. I can tell you right now, the current city council, none of us talk to each other. Okay? I can pick up the phone and call them, but whether or not they'll, 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 they'll pick up the call will be a different story. So I think the thing that we need to do is we need to agree to disagree and be very respectful and people like one another. All right, thank you. Very much. And, uh, I would like to go down the road here. I'll go ahead and remind you of the question. It is, if elected, you will be part of a five-member council. How will you work with your fellow council members to accomplish your goals? Kimberly, please. When elected, I plan to reach across the aisle and stop the bickering. Because if we don't stop the bickering and leave our characters and our different personalities at the door, we won't move my fellow over. And that's what I plan to do. I'm the community's candidate. I'm representing each of you. And that's what we need to do is put the community first. Put what's best for the city first. Yes, there is bickering. There's different members on council that might not like each other. But I see that there's a lot of positive in those that are on the current ties that I see myself in. Although I'm an independent individual, I will work with each and every one who is elected with myself. Thank you. So I said this earlier when talking about um, the deficit, but uh, we need to learn how to collaborate. Um, if we're going to be an innovative city, we need to learn to collaborate with one, with one another. And we need to be able to collaborate. Um, the collaboration of ideas, the skills, and um, of our cultures. So we have folks on the north side of Montebello, south side of Montebello. And walking these past, this past couple of months, this past month, I realized that we all have different needs. The folks on the north side have different issues than the folks on the south side. Now, we come to the council, everyone, as everyone has already stated, um, 
we might all have different ideas, but we need to be able to bring them all to the table. We need to be open to the idea that we're not, it's not going to work if it's a one-track mind. In order to move the city upward and onward we, and see it thrive, we need to be able to work with each other. Now, I, as the experience that I've had again working with local government has always been being able to work with folks on both sides of the aisle. Right. And this is what I plan to do when elected into office. Thank, Thank you, Angie. Well, it all sounds so easy, right? Um, consensus building. You know, it takes active listening. It takes working in small groups. It's allowing people to have their own opinions and be independent minds and independent thinkers. And one of the things that I discovered as a first termer was that some colleagues wanted you to go along with them. I've heard it before, go along to get along. Sometimes you have to go against the grain and stand up for what you believe and stand up against special interests. And that doesn't always play out in a nice, pretty, fluffy way. Unfortunately, when you do have somebody with strong convictions and a strong backbone and who has you know, uh, stood up to special interests with an independent mind, you create friction and you create chaos and that's what you see sometimes on the dais. And that is very difficult for somebody who, like me, comes from the music industry, not a politician. But I'm going to continue to stand up and try to be an active listener and create small groups. There we go, man. And keep working together. Woo! So, so as a city council, uh, we're five members. Uh, I equate that as a basketball team. Basketball team has five members. If each of them were to run off the ball and, and be individuals, well, are they going to win a game? Probably not. Um, so as a city council uh, member, I think uh, one of the things that I bring to the table is my ability to listen. I can talk. We can all talk. I think we all have very strong opinions and very strong uh, positions. But if we are not able to listen to each other, at the end of the day, nothing will get done. And I think most importantly, too, um, we need to be definitely respectful of each other. And definitely, we, we can agree to disagree, but at the end of the day, we have to remember that our, our one goal, and our goal is to come up with solutions and results for our city to represent our residents in, in the best and positive light. Give that big round of applause again. So if you thought those questions were difficult, now we move on to the audience questions. <laughs> so uh, we've got a few questions here to start off with. Again, you'll have one minute, um, and we will start with Bill on this front. So Bill, the first question from the audience is, businesses are building more and more apartment complexes in Montreal, and it's impacting parking. How does the city council plan on resolving the parking issue? Well, in the first place, they're not apartments, they're condominiums, which creates home ownership, which has folks that have a stake in the community, and this is beneficial because they are not unlike renters that they don't like the situation, they can put a 30 they don't spend on somewhere else. The parking situation, I've said over and over again, simply because we're allowing overbuilding on these sites and allowing the fire park to be uh, done on the streets. We have to review our condominium ordinances and, and make them more reasonable under the, the circumstances in our city. Because of the uh, overcrowded situation with so many cars already, even in our residential neighborhoods. So it's not a difficult task to do, it's simply a matter of updating our uh, condominium and codes that we haven't done for probably 20 years and make it more uh, effective for what the circumstances are today. Because so many people uh, have, used to be back in the day, it was a family car. Now you have uh, youngsters living at home, three or four cars in each family, like two parking places for each unit. We'll have to address that and uh, find a uh, reasonable solution for that. Thank you, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> Lack of parking is definitely a quality of life issue that's very important on a lot of people's minds. I see it as related, though, to the issue of transportation. Because the idea is, as we develop transportation more and more, the need for having your own vehicle will become less and less important. You know, I think California will always want to have our own car. 
so there is a regional component to this problem. Uh, you know, part of the solution is the gold line extension that's coming through. Uh, there's a lot of issues that are going to be dealt with there, but also there's other more innovative solutions that we can do anything from. The ride sharing that occurs, uh, the ability uh, of people to take services like Lyft and Uber, I think, are going to help. But another big thing is to make sure that we can have more local jobs. Because with local jobs, it really becomes an option to not have to take your vehicle to go to your work. Because people are still having to work two hours away from where they live. It's almost a necessity to have your own vehicle. So I see those two issues as well. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, question. Uh, this seems to be more impacted on the southern part of Palm Bell. As we were walking, there was a it was like four back to back neighbors that just told us the same issue. That there's uh, people in the apartments parking in front of their houses. You know, I mean, it's just really frustrating because sometimes they have to walk uh, several blocks to, um, you know, to get to their house. And sometimes there's random people parked in front of their houses. So, you know, something that we got to look into is, I mean, you know, we, we, create, we continue to create apartments or condos, and you know, our city is getting impacted on that in that regards. Um, should we look into possibly getting some permit parkings for these residential areas? You know, people, when we told them that in the South, they were like, you know what, that might be an option. We'll be willing to pay a certain amount to have this area um, you know, to save a spot for us. So those are some of the stuff that we need to start looking into because uh, definitely it's really getting impacted. Uh, specifically going down in the South, there's a lot of apartments and they are parking in residential areas. Because this is definitely a, a parking issue. I think this year alone we've dealt with uh, at least two or more issues where uh, they come to the city council and uh, we have to issue parking permits. And I think it's definitely uh, something that we need to start, start taking a harder look at because uh, you know, one of the things that's going on here is in, this, in certain areas, more so where there's apartments, uh, there are multiple families that have multiple cars. You know, where they have a couple of kids and uh, you know, when they first built this apartments, they were waiting for one car or one and a half cars to put them into a of apartments were built in the 60s and 70s. And now, you know, you have an apartment of two with maybe four or six adults living in it, and it's creating a problem. So in the previous now to the people that live in the, in the residential areas, because uh, now they're parking there where people walk two, three blocks away just to try and get to the to their, to their homes or to their apartments. So it's definitely a parking uh, issue, and I think we should definitely uh, look into it. I think one of the things so that we uh, need to fix is that if you, move, if you do the parking permits, you know, what you're doing is, uh, as one of my colleagues mentioned at the Grand Council meeting, you do the toothpaste effect. You know, you, you squeeze it from one area and you go to another, so we definitely need to stay in the All right, thank you, Mark. Yeah. I'll remind you of the question. Businesses are building more and more apartment complexes in Montebello, and it's impacting parking. How would you resolve the parking issue? So, Kimberly, please. I just need to address one thing. It's not North Montebello, South Montebello. It's one Montebello. So, I hate that the South is a redheaded stepchild. There's already one redhead here in Montebello, and that, I'm not done yet here. But to address the parking, I always encourage people to go to the city council meetings. I actually invited one, one resident, he brought up an engineering plan, and this is for Taylor and for Howard. If anybody's been there, they double park, you see UPS in the middle, and what he said, completely free to the city with his expertise, was to design diagonal parking. And because of that, just you know, listening to a resident, brought 45 parking spaces. Did we utilize that? No. Did we implement it? No. But shouldn't we listen to the residents? Because that's who it's affecting. <laughs> so that's what I plan to do when elected. So I agree with Kimberly, we are a one Montebello. However, I do live on the south side. So this is how people <laughs> identify. We will be asking which side of Montebello do you live on? Do you live in? I live south of Olympic, and I'm one of the homeowners in this in Montebello that is affected by, unfortunately, the folks who live in these apartments and in coming parking in front of my house. I feel bad that they have to walk two, three blocks in order for them to find us a parking space so that they can get home. So for me, it does make sense to have the option of having parking permits, and also we need to. The gold line extension. When I worked in the city of LA, 
I drove into the East LA station, left my car there, and took the train downtown. The apartments that are two blocks away from my house again, they have a, a red curb. People aren't even able to park there. So we need to, it is so important, and I'm so glad that you brought up this question because I am one of those homeowners that is impacted by this. People park in front of my car right. overnight, in my house overnight. I wake okay. up and there's trash on my street. That's another thing. Okay. So, thank, thank you, Angie. Thank you. Um, so being on the street ad hoc, we've approved a series of residential preferential parking districts, which has uh, sort of helped some of the neighborhoods where they have that issue. Uh, we noticed that on Via Costa, right behind Smart and Final, a lot of the older apartment buildings, as was mentioned, have multiple car owners, multiple residents. I mean, the cost of living is increased, so there's more people that have to work, that have to commute. And they were, uh, there was no like parking studies done when a lot of those properties were built. Uh, the other issue is that 32% uh, of our sales tax uh, that we rely on for the city, uh, which is a huge portion of revenue for us, you know, when you're building commercial centers and you're relying on sales tax to fund your public safety, you can't just do away with, with parking issues because you need to have those big box stores, you need to have the commercialism that is going to sustain the city. And the vehicle license fee taxes are also a big portion. They're 14% of our revenue. So All unless right. everybody's going to take uh, mass transit, we have a problem. Okay, then. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I think it's been mentioned, but uh, there are definitely zoning standards that need to be reviewed. Uh, it is in our general plan. But again, our general plan hasn't been reviewed for well over, it's well overdue, let's just say. Uh, probably older than I am. Um, and so, uh, let's start there. Let's review our zoning standards. Secondly, uh, we have a great transit system. Um, we are also looking at the Gold Line extension. These are things that we need to start, uh, one is helping and educating our community uh, working with the transit uh, companies, encouraging more uh, ride sharing, but also let's open up some bike lanes. Let's make this community a community that is uh, road sharing uh, between cars, bikes, and, and, and the like. But I think again, let's, let's utilize what we have, the resources we have, like our transit system as well. And lastly, in terms of development, let's also start looking at smart development, which addresses these issues as well. All right, thank you very much. Certainly, businesses are building more and more apartment complexes in Montebello, and it's impacting parking. How does the City Council, if you're on the City Council, plan on resolving the parking issue? So, I think the question is framed in a very interesting way. It says that businesses are building more and more condos and it's affecting parking. So, we definitely have parking issues as it stands today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you talk to South Montebello, uh, even up here in North Montebello, people have to park uh, seven blocks away from their homes uh, because of these developments. Going forward, I think we need to be um, very careful about what kind of developments we do. Uh, we need to look at today's current culture and we need to plan appropriately. Um, as it's been mentioned before, there was uh, one family, one car, that was about it. Now you're having multiple people with multiple cars or multiple people to take advantage of you know, uh, lower, uh, paying lower rent. So we need to take today's current climate uh, into account. We need to uh, plan our condos appropriately. We need to do appropriate zoning uh, and make sure that we're not cramming things in because developers are gonna put as few parking spaces as they can in there to maximize the revenues that they're getting from units. So the city council needs to stand up for the residents and make sure that we're doing what's right for the cultural plan. All right, thank you. David. And uh, the start of the next one, uh, next question here will be a shot. So I will ask that question now. This is again an audience question. Montebello, like surrounding communities, has a housing shortage. What, if anything, would you propose to address this issue? And it also says parking issues, which I guess will go along with that as we're talking about. Well, I mean, it's all interrelated. Uh, whether or not, uh, it's clearly, a, it's a fact that housing shortage has caused a whole host of problems, rising rents, uh, parking issues. Uh, but I think the solution is really back to something that's been mentioned, it's called smart development. We have to make sure that the development that we do includes uh, 
conditions and, and, and other uh, design elements that, that will address this need for affordable housing. Uh, I think affordable housing is very important and, and, and it's something that we must be including more and more in our developments. I think they've been doing a good job with some of the new developments that we've done off of Olympic Boulevard and I think those will set the model for other things that we can do in the future. All right, thank you. Okay, Salvador. Yeah, so we definitely do have a, a housing um, crisis and uh, we need to look more into affordable housing. Um, you know, like, like it's been stated, we are building a lot of condominiums, a lot of apartments, uh, but we need to start looking into land where we can actually build housing, affordable housing, uh, start giving a, you know, a bigger opportunity to, to actually be able to afford these houses. Uh, something that's been lacking too is that we have a lot of people, you know, people walking that are leaving on the because of, of what's going on here in the city and, and how the city has gone down. And we have a lot of rent here also with, with housing. So we need to get affordable housing. We need to keep people in here in the city. Uh, and that, you know, that even goes in line to beautifying the city. If we keep people that actually are homeowners here, it beautifies the city. So definitely it's not going to start looking into uh, smart development and just start building more and more housing. All right, thank you. Sort because if you do one, you're going to have the consequences of the other. So uh, I do think affordable housing and also uh, uh, definitely going to bring the parking issue. But I think, uh, as uh, Rick mentioned already, uh, smart development is definitely the way to go. I think if you're going to go ahead and do affordable housing, you definitely have to account for the type of vehicles and how many vehicles you're going to deal with. Either. And uh, either the property manager or somehow the code enforcement or the city have to start enforcing those. Because then what happens is, even though some of these leases uh, require that you only have one or two vehicles, because that's what the parking spots that we have, uh, once you know people move in, you know, they have three or four vehicles uh, that are taken up for parking. Now, as far as the housing, uh, we have been uh, proactive in that area. We have had uh, some developments in Olympic Boulevard, the other ones are on in, uh, in Washington, so uh, there's another one at Fever Hines and uh, Greenwood. So there has been some, some developments that have been going on as far as housing, but uh, definitely uh, by doing one, definitely affect the other. Thank you. And as the light moves down, I'll remind you of the question. Montebello, like surrounding communities, has a housing shortage. What, if anything, would you propose to address this issue and in related parking issues? Kimberly, please. Well, Montebello is landlocked, so I'm going to address the elephant in the room. Montebello Hills project. We have a new developer. Um, we have the Toll Brothers. And why don't we just have a town hall to see what their plan is? And then let's listen to them because a lot of us want to know what's going to happen with the hills. But there's also some of us that want a second opportunity to look at the traffic and safety. We want to look at the DIR report. We want to look at fire. We want to look at the water situation, the school situation on the hills. But again, uh, I'm an avid environmentalist, a member of the Sierra Club. I want to know what's going on with the Creatures and little animals that are living there. What is going to happen to their habitat? But being landlocked, I think we need to look at them. But listen to us. How about mixed use? But let's see what the developers are going to bring in. So that's how I address the question. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I agree with what everyone just said here. Um, but I do believe in just beginning walking this past month. It is unfortunate to find out how many folks are moving out of, out of the city. Just in one block, I spoke to five different people, elderly folks. Um, so I would like the idea of smart development. Um, we do need affordable housing. We also, with the Montebello Hills project, we, we do need some high-end housing in this property that's going to also attract some businesses and in turn, Right, we'll go back into the public safety. Everyone, it all trickles down to everything. But affordable housing. I know that my parents are. Uh, my parents lost their home eight years ago, so they're now renters. We need to make sure that these rents don't continue to go up either, because we have our elderly to also care for, who are now either they're homeowners or renters. But affordable housing is what we. I think every city needs. Thank you very much. So part of the other issue is cutting through a lot of the red tape and the bureaucracy um, in City Hall, uh, 
plan chips that come back and forth and back and forth and kind of gouge people who want to build, the engineers. Um, we got to make sure that City Hall gets open on Fridays. We're not even open on Fridays. A lot of people are frustrated when they come into our City Hall because uh, they go, oh, we didn't know, you know, we want to bring plans in. And uh, they're closed. Uh, the other issue is building and planning department, I think, is one person, maybe two. You know, and, and those are other issues with staffing. We're very, very understaffed. You know, the water system is outdated. Uh, one of the issues we have with the mixed use property on Whittier Boulevard, the new Olsen project, which is going to have a container uh, concept for food, was water. And the water system in that block needed to support and sustain the development. So you have to look at the water system as well. You have to look at your sewer system. Um, we don't even have a sewer feed. So there's there's a lot of contributing factors to this problem. Okay. It's, it, there's, it, there's layers. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> so as, as many of you probably know, our redevelopment agencies were disbanded. Uh, that means we have no affordable housing funds. Now, uh, the Hills development, that uh, is already been approved. It's moving forward. Uh, I probably would have, uh, you know, pushed for affordable housing there. Uh, that's not the case for this Hills development. But to address it at this point in time, I think we, we do, and many of us have already mentioned, smart development. Uh, we are going to be, you know, looking at the gold line extension. Let's use these transportation hubs as areas for housing, uh, where we can also develop multi-use areas, where, where we can not just bring in housing, but also look at businesses that can go into that area. And then that creates a thriving community of people uh, with, that are housed there, but also have services around them and transportation. So those are some of the things that I would address in terms of housing. Thank you. This is a question that's difficult uh, for me to see by myself. I feel that I would like to talk to the community and see how they feel about it. And the reason why I say that is this. One thing that I appreciate about Montebello is that we have these beautiful uh, single family homes, these beautiful single family properties. That's a spirit that I want to preserve because I think there's a pride of ownership from being here for 40, 50, 60 years that comes from these properties. Um, as we bring in uh, higher density housing, I feel that the connection to Montebello um, starts to lessen. Another thing on top of that is that um, you start to bring in uh, a lot more traffic, like we mentioned. So I, I would also like to see uh, mixed developments, mixed use properties where you both have businesses to increase your tax base, uh, but also increasing um, property taxes. Um, that, that happens. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Would you like to hear the question again? Yes, thank you. No, I quite gather with the question and the issue. Unfortunately, this is far too complex an issue to try to address in one minute. Uh, there's a lot of aspects of it that need to be considered. But because of the cost of housing in Southern California, uh, many people are forced to rent. And landlords are raising rents at such a uh, fast rate that it's uh, causing people to have to spend 50 or 60 percent of their income uh, just for a, to keep a roof over their head and keep very little for the other basic necessities. This is totally unacceptable. The major H that we passed at the last uh, election in November has started to have some very positive impacts, but one of the main things they're looking at is making government, industrial, commercial, uh, some of the school properties that can be, afforded, uh, can be converted to affordable housing, and I think that's at least one area to be started in, but like I said, there's so many other aspects of it, I just don't have the time to uh, address those in a short period of time that we have to address this question. Okay, thank you, Bill. All right. Good job, you guys are on it. So uh, we're going to do one more audience question. We have time for one more to get through all everybody before we go to closing. So this will be the last audience question, and this how it works starts it. Uh, do you believe you can keep the city's fire and police departments under local control? Yeah. So um, you know that, that's a that's a good question, and as we know, currently our our police officers, and we have a great uh, police unit and fire unit, uh, we're understaffed, and it's, it's, been a, it's been a problem for that for a while, so we need to make sure how we can, it comes back to how can we increase revenue to be able to support 
um, our, our local police officers. There's a lot of, uh, again, neighboring cities that, that don't have the luxury to have their own local police or local, or local fire department. So it's something that, that we, I know we take pride in, we love our, our police unit, we love our firefighters, but it's something that definitely goes back into the question of how can we create enough revenue to uh, continue to sustain um, our police unit and to even touch upon pensions too, uh, that we have a high rise in, in pensions and uh, um, you know, in, in our local um, um, government. So if, um, yeah, I mean, we need to, to address all that and if we can continue to sustain it, we, we want to continue to sustain our police unit here. All right, thank you. Art. Yes, so at the election of 2009, um, the, the, the residents are the ones that have to decide whether or not we keep our public safety. Uh, they voted that uh, only by a vote of the people we can get rid of the county with police and fire. So in the meantime, we have to come up with solutions to figure out how are we going to keep them fully staffed and give them the equipment that they need, and at the same time make sure that there are competitive levels as far as the salary with the surrounding cities. And by that, I have done uh, what I consider some tough decisions, giving it up to the vote of the people. Uh, other than this conception is that I want that I wanted sales tax, that I wanted so a water company, you know, we let the community decide that. And right now we have another issue with the cannabis as to whether we, we enforce the legalization of, of the, the, the cannabis and make some revenue out of it because the bottom line is that, that we're not going anywhere with, with, with our police and fire and we need to sustain them. So uh, I think the number one thing that we need to do is to definitely increase our revenue, whether it be through development, uh, bringing in more business, and just try to think outside of the box and make some hard decisions. As the light makes it way back down to uh, Kimberly, I'm going to ask the question again. Do you believe that you can keep the city's fire and police departments under local control? One minute, please. Go ahead. Public safety is my number one concern because of the residents. I want the residents to feel safe. But having our police officers with 20 year old guns, fire trucks that are making mouths put together, I think that needs to change. We need to reduce crime so we can help those sworn officers that I want to bring in, because right now we only have six on patrol at any given time. I want to bring back the park ranger program. Just bringing back the park ranger program, that deters crime that's happening in the parks. So just that alone would help with our officers. Another thing is I'm looking into a graffiti program. It's called the graffiti tracking program. It's utilized by our neighboring cities, Monterey Park, El Monte, and others. And with that one, that's how gangs communicate to each other. If we eliminate the graffiti, then that would help with the crimes going down. Another thing is um, neighborhood watch. We are going to one of the senior center uh, neighborhood watch meeting next one's November 13th. That one, we're the ones that are helping the police. So uh, hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I believe that we do need to be um, we do need to keep our police department and our private department. Uh, we also need to be smart about how we are going to generate revenue in order to be able to hire these bodies. So whether it's business development, um, now we have the cannabis ordinance, the Montebello Hills project, building high-end um, properties that will attract businesses into our city that could possibly generate revenue that would allow us to hire more police officers. Public safety, I believe, is probably all of our top issues. I have children. I live in the south side of Montebello, and I'll say it again, the south side of Montebello, where sometimes we call, we call the police department, and it's unfortunate that they can't come soon enough because we're sh short, they're short-staffed. So I believe that if we get creative, and figure out a way to generate revenue so that we can hire more officers. We will absolutely, we have to keep our departments here in the city. All right, thank you very much. Vivian. Well, of course I'm all for local control. Um, and yes, we would have to put it to a vote of the people. But we also have to be realistic because public safety is very costly. And we've got, if you look at a lot of our agendas, we have litigation after litigation after workman's comp uh, claims. Uh, we've got pensions for life that are no longer sustainable in this city. When you look at our budget, and I've gone through a few of them in my first term, you know, we're a self-insured city. We've got rising litigation costs, and I don't know that we could sustain it. 
It, it may or may not be, but I'm definitely for having our own police and fire. I think that is, is, is something that sets us apart, much like Burbank, like Monterey Park, like Whittier, all of the other nice affluent cities, um, which we were and which we are. And we need to continue to be one. So uh, that's Thank my you. short answer. Thank you, Vivian. So uh, I think you've heard already, and I think you would agree, uh, we are very proud to have our own police and fire departments. Um, and I would agree with that. Now, uh, of course, that also comes with the reality that they do take up at least 65% of our budget. That's a huge amount of our budget. So that means that we, we do need to address the issue of revenue. Um, to ensure that we're being competitive with other cities because that's how we lose our officers because we can't afford to keep many of our officers here. So sustainability is an issue. Um, and how do we address that? We, I, I would encourage, uh, again, more neighborhood watch programs. I think we as a community need to be uh, involved in, in ensuring the safety of our communities and look at business development. Whether it's a sales tax that could have helped, and cannabis, which definitely is an area uh, that can generate uh, revenue and, can, and where things like public safety can be addressed. So this is an issue where I feel the community and the council has to have an honest conversation with each other. Police and fire take up a huge part of our annual budget, but at the same time, there's a massive point of pride in seeing Montebello blazing across uh, police car doors and, and across firefighter apparatuses. Um, you know, actually coming down here, <coughs> sheriff's passed me um, right there on the, uh, right here um, by by the park, and kind of like rubbing the wrong way a little bit. That's that's something that's something you can't put a price on. Is that pride? Another thing is also seeing firefighters and police on the scene in other municipalities. These are, act as ambassadors of Montebello. I want to try as hard as I can to try and keep them within the city. Um, and also keep in mind that if you did go county, that the cost doesn't necessarily go away. We're still contracting with the county. They uh, start to control costs. They can do annual rate hikes. Those police that you see on the street that we were facing our own in those fire um, are still going to be costing the city money and we're going to lose uh, those financial controls. Thank you, David. This local control of police and fire is very important. We have a lot higher level of service and faster response time than any of the cities around us that have county services. We have an outstanding group of young men and women that are in our police and fire department that work hard to keep our community safe. I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. We don't have a revenue problem, we have an irresponsible spending problem. In the past two years, over $50 million in one bid and single bid contracts have been out. We're simply not getting the best value for our dollars. We could have even saved 10 or 15 percent of that money. We've been millions of dollars going into the general fund, not only to cover our deficit, but also to properly fund and continue to improve our police and fire department because the safety of our families and the safety of our community is the number one priority as far as I'm concerned. Yes, and uh, this is one of those questions, as has been said earlier, it's kind of difficult to deal with the complexity of the issue in one minute. But one of the things that we need to realize, it's not just a matter of pride that we have our own departments, it's, it's the level of service that we get. There's no guarantee that if county came in on contract that we would get a better level, level of service. And in fact, we'd have less control, so it would be something that would be harder to do something about if we did. But I've spent the time, I've gone on a ride along with the police and the fire, I've been spending time there, and one solution that we came up with is to do the police foundation. And it turns out if you don't want to take credit, there's a lot of things you can get done. And I didn't. I just wanted this police foundation to be in place, and so far, with the com complete consensus of the council, that police foundation has raised $100,000 from our business community who has stepped up to say we support the police. And it's just another way of getting citizen involved. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll now move on to the candidate's closing statements. This is one minute. We'll start with you, Art. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, on the road of six, you have the choice to pick any one of us to be your next councilman or woman. Uh, for the last eight and a half years, we're going online. I have been your councilman, and I've worked really hard 
for this committee to try and move ahead and to try and make it fiscally responsible. Although, in some of you, we may disagree on that. I'd like to see uh, four more years so that we can fund some of the projects that we have. Uh, one of the things that I definitely want to go ahead and do is uh, keep the city uh, the police and fire. And then I'm also going to, I'm sorry, so that was a little distraction there. And then I want to go ahead and see to fruition some of the developments that we have planned, for example, a possible site and some of the developments that are coming up on Wooded Boulevard. Because again, the number one problem in this city is bringing in revenue. You can get rid of all council members right now and bring in a whole new crew. Guess what, folks? They're going to have the exact same problem that we have right now that we had nine years ago when we first got in. We need to increase our revenue. Okay. You did a great job. Please, please give her a round of applause. All right, Kimberly. First off, thanks. Thank you. All of you, I know you have families at home. You have kids. And I know my wonderful supporting husband that's here. And because of him, we're going to raise our family here with all of your families as well. I'm a community candidate. So I'm endorsed by each of you the residents, the business owners, and I plan to be the voice, like I have been, advocating for what's best for the city, not for my personal interest, but what's best for Montebello. Also, I, I'm trustworthy, I'll continue to be trustworthy, I plan to serve my community like I have been, I'm an explorer with the Montebello Fire Department, I was a commissioner for culture and recreation, I don't just pat myself on the back, I, but since we're doing it, I was one of the ones who helped write the grant for the canines here from one of the local police departments that was certified grant writer. So that's another thing that I can help bring to the table. Again, I'm not a politician, but I'm a community advocate. So November 6th, Kimberly Ann Coco's call for him. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Angie, please. So professionally, I have dedicated myself to public service. Working as a community relations representative for the Montebello East Lake Family Support Center. This was 10 years ago and no longer exists. Also as a constituent service representative for the mayor of Los Angeles as a faith rooted organizer for Blue LA, which is clergy and aid united for economic justice. So my experience as a public servant and a social justice advocate makes me a great candidate. I want to work with residents to be able to find common sense solutions to balance our budget, increase our public safety, and help our local businesses. I also want to address the issues that concern of concern of most to our most vulnerable residents, which are the homeless children, our youth, the undocumented seniors and veterans. I won't be naive and think that I'm gonna be able to do this on my own. Because as as I said earlier, I believe in I believe in innovation. And with innovation comes collaboration of minds, ideas, and skills. As leaders, we must learn to empower our residents and our youth. Our residents are youth for, in order for all of us to take pride in moving the city upward and onward okay. and to see it thrive once again. Thank you very thank much, you. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. It's been an honor to serve my hometown for my first term. Uh, one of the things that I'm most proud of is getting the $110 million Caltrans Roadway Improvement Project that has taken me six years to work on. If you've noticed the Pomona Freeway, you've seen Caltrans here a lot more than they ever have since the freeway didn't exist. That's how long I've been here. I used to play there was cows and horses. There was no freeway in 1964. Now, imagine that. That we're now getting landscape improvements, irrigation, new guardrails, and we're going to get brand new pavement because I have worked for six years to get that $110 million project done. And it is now coming to pass. I am so proud of that work. I have gone to Sacramento and I lobbied for the city not to go into bankruptcy. I went up there with, with my colleagues and we prevailed. I am very proud of those accomplishments. I am also proud that I worked very hard on many ad hocs with colleagues, with staff, and I will continue to do so okay. on your behalf. All right. As an independent leader, I can tell you right now that I know how to be a team player. I have the willingness to work with all sides, make sure that I listen, not just to my colleagues, but to the residents. I think that's the most important part. 
We also need to stop the infighting. I think that's a lot of the reasons why we have lack of trust and feel there is no transparency in our city. My commitment to you again is to create long-term solutions to address our budget issues. Better communication between not just our city council, but also with the residents. Look at a business plan. Make sure that we have the right uh, tools to bring in new business and work with the community to also engage everyone in solution making. So as I sit here and humbly ask for your vote, I want to thank you for coming tonight. I know it takes a lot of time out of your day. And if you still have questions, I invite you to email me at Lopez, number four, city council at Gmail. Thank you again, and I, I hope to see you when I'm walking these next two weeks. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Montebello's current climate wasn't created overnight. Uh, the politics of the last couple of decades have led us to our current situation. When I decided to run, I wanted to prove to the voters that I wanted to be a representative, not just a politician. That's why I attended council meetings for a year and a half, town halls, and community meetings. From there, I heard two things. One, that they didn't want money, money uh, in people's pockets. Well, in your pockets, of course. Not in my pockets. And, and they didn't want uh, political connections. That's why I'm funding my campaign myself um, you know, to show you that I am not connected financially uh, to any special interest, to any uh, special group, business, or, or, um, or political group. And the second thing that I did is I decided to run uh, without attaching myself to any candidate, to truly be an independent voice on the council, to truly represent the residents, and to truly be a voice for the community of Montebello. I think you've heard my position on many of the issues, and let me say it as plainly as I can with the number of coffee hours on, to the individual residents. You reelect me and give me three votes on the city council, I guarantee you we'll have the city back on sound financial footing within a year. It's not rocket science. Get rid of the good old boy system and get back to sound business practice. Yeah. That is the, uh, the whole key to it. We'll have revenue, maintain our own police and fire department, as well as begin to meet the other needs of our community. I want to thank the chamber for hosting this this evening and for all of you to take time out to hear our positions on the issue. And I would urge you to carefully consider what you've heard this evening here this evening as you uh, consider casting your ballot uh, on November the 6th. With that, I again thank you for your kind attention and uh, God bless and enjoy the rest of the evening. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do want to thank the Chamber for this opportunity as well as all the other candidates here for a Spirited Forum. I am someone that believes in the ethic of service to your fellow man. It's something that I truly believe in, and it's really the, one of the main reasons why I'm running. I'm an attorney by trade. I'm an ethics expert. I have a business degree from USC. The last two years I've spent being your treasurer, and for six years before that I was a commissioner. And I believe I bring with that a unique mix of experience and education that doesn't currently exist in the council. And I don't think I'm going to solve all the problems by myself. I want to be part of a team. And I think that one interesting definition of leadership that I want all of you to consider is that a leader is someone who can bring out the best in everyone on the team. So please consider me as one of your three votes this November 6th. I'd be honored to receive your support. Thank you. All right, first of all, thank you for joining us here and uh, being part of this. Um, this is a city I love. This is a city I grew up in. This is a city I was raised in. This is a city I'm going to continue to live in. I'm going to give my everything and my all to continue to move this city upward. Um, regardless if I get elected, regardless what happens after November 6th, I'm going to continue to stay involved. Continue to you know, promote the city, continue to work with them to see how we can move the city, how we can fix our problems. You know, um, with, with that being said, you know, we're, we're going to be in there. I'm going to get transparency, host town halls, and just really unite and work together. Today here, we're in the spotlight, but the city won't move forward unless all of you participate and all of you stay engaged and all of you work together. It's, you know, we can only do so much. It's gonna require a lot of, what, you know, the audience here for you guys to participate and help us move the city forward. So hopefully, uh, after today, and hopefully after you get to meet me afterwards, uh, I can count on your support for November 6th. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, Montebello residents have a really great pool of candidates to choose from. I'm very proud to say that we have a, a panel here of intelligent, passionate people. And um, <coughs> I, I, I'm glad that you guys were able to participate and share your views with us. I, I know that the community is going to benefit from this process. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have community members uh, who filled the room today. Some of you have remained standing through the whole uh, event, and I do apologize for that. We tried to put in, squeeze in as many chairs as we could. So for those, all those of you who have been on your feet all, all night, I really, uh, I appreciate you. Thank you for your, your commitment to our community. That's what that shows me. Um, viewers who are watching at home, they're commenting right now on Facebook. Uh, some of you missed the beginning. When this event is over, I promise you, we're going to upload this recording onto our Facebook page. If you want to share it with others, if you missed the beginning of this event, you can view it on, on the Montebello Chamber of Commerce Facebook page. Um, I neglected to thank the most really important person tonight, he drove out from Cerritos on his own time as a volunteer, and he's a busy guy, but he drove out here in traffic just so we could have an impartial uh, moderator to support the democratic process, because that's who he is, and I, I really want to thank Scott Smith. He's our uh, Government Affairs Committee again, our sponsor, Sentinel Peak Resources, who made it possible for us to be in this room, our volunteers, some of whom also have been standing all night. We appreciate you. Thank you for making it possible. We couldn't possibly do it uh, alone uh, with three staff members, so our volunteers are a very important part of the process that we'll be able to offer you tonight. Um, please remember that your vote counts to move our city forward. So make your, your decisions thoughtfully. We hope that this process, this event tonight, has helped you in making your decisions. And uh, do not forget to, to, to make your vote count and, uh, and vote on November 6th. Uh, thank you to the Quiet Cannon for their support uh, in having this event happen. And um, thank you for being here tonight. Yes. Uh, there, I'm, there's another forum happening on Tuesday, October 23rd. Uh, where is that going to be held? At the Senior Center at the City Park, at Marvel City Park. The time? 7 to 9 p.m. Okay, so you have another opportunity. Uh, thank you so much for everybody. Uh, have a great night.